Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning. It's good to be in God's house together. Uh, where, where did I, there's, there it went. Let's see. You know when the cover falls off my remote, before we even start, it may be a long day with the remote. So it's today as we continue our foundational study, uh, what is it that we believe? When we say we're a Bible-believing church, what does that mean? We've been talking through that about what we learn from the creation story and the early stories in the book of Genesis, the first three chapters uh, that we're kind of in right now. And next week we're going to make a move into Lent. And so instead of talking about what God did and why He did it, we're going to spend some time talking about what humans did in response to God which is kind of where we get things kind of messed up. And that's what we're going to kind of be talking as we go forward in Lent. But today, we're talking about the fact that life is full of choices and that we have to make good choices. Now, I don't know if any of you remember the... Alex, you're going to have to help me here. Yeah, go to the one with the night on it. There you go. Anybody remember this guy? Okay. Indiana Jones and the quest for the Holy Grail. Thank you. Thank you. Obviously, we're going to have to have movie night, Michelle, and just play. We're going to have to say these are all Pastor Steve's movies that he might use in a sermon illustration sometime, and you all need to know them. But Indiana Jones, after he gets through all the traps and all the things that could trip him up, To collect and select the Holy Grail, there's a whole table full of these Grail cups sitting there, right? Along the side. And he says, which one is it? And the knight says, choose wisely. I'm not going to tell you. Choose wisely. And so he looks at all of them, and there's gold ones and silver ones and fancy ones, and then he notices that one looks different. What does it look like? It's wooden, it's plain, it's simple. And he goes, that is the cup of a carpenter. And when he picks it up and he drinks from it, knowing that either he's going to be fine or he's going to die. One of the two choices. And he doesn't die. The old knight says, you have chosen wisely. That is, to some essence, the question that lies before us as humanity every day. How do we choose and what do we choose? If you could give me the slide with the two doors on it, please, Alex. The Joshua phrases it this way to the Israelites just before they, well, just after they've conquered the promised land. There you go, perfect. And he says, choose this day who you will serve. We have choices every day. We have choices about what we're going to drink for breakfast, what we're going to do with our day, how fast we're going to drive, whether we're going to drive on the right shoulder. I knew I was back in Maryland on I-70 the other day, because I drove back from Indiana from the funeral yesterday. I knew I was back on I-70 in Maryland. Within about 10 minutes of being in there, somebody passed me on the right shoulder. (laughs) I knew I was home. Here I am. Yep. They didn't do that in Indiana. i got to show them how to do that in Indiana, apparently. (laughs) But we choose where we're going to drive, how fast we're going to drive. We choose how we treat other people. We choose how we respond to circumstances. Our lives are full of choices. And ultimately, the most important choice is the one that we also have to make every day in small, subtle ways, and that is, Who will I serve today? Will I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Will I serve him and walk in his way? Or will I choose to do my own thing? When we choose the Lord, we are given life abundantly. When we choose to walk in his way, it doesn't mean that it's always easy, but it's always blessed and good because he's with us. And the good news is that even when we choose poorly, God's still waiting for us to come back, isn't he? As it says about the prodigal son, when he came to his senses, he said, let me arise and go back to my father's house. And God's arms are always open to welcome us back when we choose to come. So today, as we worship and as we celebrate, as we turn our hearts towards our choice for the Lord, 
whether that's in the scriptures that are read, the songs that are sung, and the baby dedication, and the words uh, of the message, may we always be inviting the Holy Spirit to come and help us choose rightly and wisely and choose God every day. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come into your house, that we can gather with our family and worship you and praise you, that we can celebrate your goodness to us, that we can bask in your love and grace and mercy. And Lord, thank you that when we choose to come home, when we turn our eyes back towards you, your arms are always open. And when we choose to have you in our heart, you lead us and bless us each and every day. Lead us now into worship as you prepare us for the week ahead. Move in our midst, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. So fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. I'm going to read Psalm 78, 1 to 7. And it's, O oh my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I am saying. For I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past past stories we have heard and known, stories our ancestors had handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them even the children not yet born, and they in turn will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. This morning, we have the privilege of joining in a baby dedication, so I want to invite Gunnar and his family to come forward. Brett and Chloe Dearman, and then if Tristan and Kendall, the godparents. So the scripture we read reminds us that we are to remember ourselves what God has done, but then we are also to share that with our children so that they too will come to a place where they will put their faith in the Lord, and then they will in turn pass it on to the next generation. We learn from our parents so much. That is actually one of the really big struggles with being a parent, I think, is because you look around and they're watching you, (laughs) and they're learning from you, and not always just the best things, right? But God says, listen, I have given you a gift. I've given you Gunner, and I have chosen you two to be his parents. He sees in you the ability to raise this child, and so he's given you this great obligation and ask you to be stewards of his creation as he is growing up. And so as you come today, you make the promise that you are going to be teaching him who Jesus is and how to walk with him. You're going to tell him of the things and the glorious goodness of God. Uh, To that end, we have a Bible storybook for you to read to him as he's growing up so that he might come to know the stories of Jesus' love and how he walked in this world. So it's a dedication on your part that you're going to raise him. It's a dedication on the part of the godparents that you're going to be there for him. Because at a certain point, yes, he still needs his parents, but he needs someone who's not his parents that will give him good advice and will be there to listen for him and watch over him. And that is your responsibility. And you pledge yourselves to that today. And as a congregation, we gather around the family that is here to say, we will be praying for a little gunner. We will be lifting him up in our prayers, and we will be walking alongside through spirit and through prayer that he might grow and that he might always know that he always has a place, as your family does here in our church. Now, in 
the scriptures, we discover that they anoint special things as a way of marking them and saying these are special and they're set aside for God's use. Now, we all know that Gunner is special already. But I anoint you, Gunner, Edward, Dearman, smart child. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this miracle that I'm holding. I thank you for Gunner, that you breathe life into him. And I thank you that you saw fit to give him to Brett and Chloe to be their child to raise. And I thank you for the family and the godparents and the church that are here to lift him up today as we dedicate him to you and them to you as well. And I pray, Lord, that your spirit would descend upon him and that you would bless him and keep him, and that you would protect him as he grows up. That your spirit might fill him so that one day he might turn his eyes and his heart, and he would choose you and to walk with you. And I pray that you will keep him until that day safe, and that he will choose to follow you. I pray for Brett and Chloe that you would bless them, give them patience and strength and wisdom. Help them know how to raise their child. Help them know when to say yes and when to say no. Help them as they grow closer to each other, even as they grow closer to him, and that they all might grow closer to you. Bless his family, Lord, as they gather around him. Bless his godparents as they walk beside him. And most of all, Lord, bless him in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And together, all of God's children said, Amen. Gunnar, you know all these people over here. You're used to seeing them, but I want to show you another spiritual family here, and that is all these people. These people are going to be praying for you, and I know you don't know them, and you might not get to remember their names, but I want you to know that they love you, and they want the best for you, and that they are always going to be there, just as God is always going to be there whenever you need them. All you have to say is, Jesus... I need you today, and he will be right there for you. Okay. Who wants to hold him while we sprinkle him? Okay. Here we go. Okay. As these drops of water fall around you and upon you, may they be reminders of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which reigns around each of us every day when we put our faith and our hope in him. Touch it. <laughs> May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to be shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May you know the love of God, the salvation of Jesus Christ. May the Holy Spirit hold you in his hands as you hold Gunner close to you. Amen. Here is your certificate, and here is... Your Bible storybook to read to him. And may God bless you in your journey. See, he's already ready to go. Very good. Thank you. For it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of all our ancestors, who has brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. This is the same Jesus whom you handed over and rejected before Pilate, despite Pilate's decision to release him. You rejected this holy righteous one and instead demanded the release of a murderer. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this fact. Through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed. And you know how crippled he was before. Faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. Friends, I realize that what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance, but God was fulfilling what all the prophets had foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. And he will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah, for he must remain in heaven until the time for the final restoration of all things, as God promised long ago 
through his holy prophets. As we continue to walk through the creation story and talk about um, God and his relationship, his intended relationship with humanity, we have to rec- put me on the next slide, please. We're just we have to recognize something. And that is when God created us, one of the things he endowed us with was the free will of choice. It's the ability to choose to have faith in him or not to have faith in him. To say, I believe or I don't believe. The choice to follow or to walk away. And the Bible is about God's desire, his work to get humanity, after it has chosen poorly, to begin to choose rightly, which means to choose him. Scripture tells us, next slide please that God is constantly asking a question. From very first in the garden, in in Genesis chapter 2, verses 14, 15, and 16, I think it is, he says, you can eat whatever you want here, except what? The fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's a choice. I'm giving you all this, just don't do that. It's not phrased in the sense of, you can do this or you can do that. Because God is not thinking anybody would choose poorly. It doesn't make sense to God to disobey Him because He wants the best for us. The way that He has laid everything out is that if we will follow Him, then we will function individually and as families and communities as humanity in the world in a way that is not only pleasing to Him, but is harmonious and peaceful between us. We talked about how then if we follow the Lord, then there is peace and relationship between us and God and then us and our neighbors. He says, just don't eat that. Just don't eat that. And so, of course, what do they do? They go eat that. And from then on, we see this downhill spiral. We'll talk more about that next week of humanity who just starts realizing, oh, I can make bad choices and this is so much fun. Well, at least that's the way we must convince ourselves to make. I mean, whoever starts out with this? This is a bad choice. It's going to be painful. It's going to cost me a lot. Yes, I want to do that. We don't normally have that conversation and then choose the bad one, right? Okay, I recognize that every so often we'll be in an argument and we will know we shouldn't say the next thing that comes out of our mouth and we'll still choose to say it. But most of the time, we don't think and say, oh, well, this is a bad choice. I should do that. And yet that's what we do because we convince ourselves it's a good choice. And so often we convince ourselves that the best choice is to do exactly opposite of what God asks us to do. So God is always coming and asking this God question. These are the God questions that shows up in the Bible. Will you choose God? Will you choose me? Will you come back to God because you've wandered away? Will you follow God faithfully this time? Will you accept my forgiveness? Will you choose mercy over judgment and wrath? Will you choose to do the right things this time? Those are all questions that involve humanity having a response. They have a choice. They can say, yes, I choose you, God, or no, I'm not. They can say, I can come home to you, or I can stay away. They can say, I will follow God faithfully, or I'll go do my own thing. We have the ability to say, I will accept your forgiveness or I will refuse to accept your forgiveness. We can choose to accept mercy and to extend mercy or we can choose to reject mercy and not extend mercy. We can choose to do the right things and we can choose to do our own things, can't we? They're all choices we get to make because God gave us that ability to choose and he said, listen, I I can make humans in any way that I wanted. And I can make them always do the right thing, but that's not going to be a real relationship. If I control them so they only do what I want them to do, that's not a real relationship because there's not love involved in that. I want them to love me and want to follow me. He assumed we would from the start because I think he thought we were smarter than we are. And then he discovers we're not. And this sin thing becomes, gets out of hand, and it just keeps snowballing. 
And we end up with a story of Noah where God's just like, all right, that's it. Everyone out. I'm done. I'll take you and you and you, this family. I'm going to stick you in a boat, and I'm done with everything else. I'm just going to wash it all clean. We're going to start over, clean slate, so to speak. And what do we discover just a few verses after Noah and his family get out of the ark? They still can make bad choices. And God says, you know what? I love them. And I know their hearts are bent towards evil. I know they have a tendency to choose the wrong. But I will contend for them from now on. And he contended with us so much that he did what? He sent his son, Jesus Christ, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but what? Have eternal life. A life better today and a life better tomorrow. And this question of coming back is over and over. Alex, if I could have the next slide, please. We see it in Abraham and his descendants. He says, Abraham, go with me to a strange land. Worship me. And sometimes Abraham chooses very well, doesn't he? He packs up his family and he heads out. And he builds altar and he worships the God. And then he says he's going to trust God. But then we had a few hiccups, don't we? But God says, nope, I'm still here if you'll come back. And Abraham chooses him and his descendants choose him. And then we get to the book of Exodus, and they're all in slavery in Egypt. And he shows up and he talks to Moses, doesn't he? In a burning bush, he says, hey, Moses, I need you to go do this. And Moses comes up with all sorts of arguments, doesn't he? But does he go? He chooses to go. And he chooses to lead the people out of Israel. And he leads them to the mountain. And he says, choose that you're going to worship the Lord today. And they said, oh, we want to worship the Lord. Now, how long did that last? Not real long. But he says, choose again, come back, and they come back. And then Joshua leads the people into the promised land, finally. And they conquer the whole promised land. And we get to this passage that Quentin read so well at the beginning of the service. They're done with the promised land. They've conquered almost all that they were supposed to. Side note, there's a little bit they didn't, but that's another story. That's, that's my cover for the person that says, well, they didn't do this to me later. Yes, I know, they didn't conquer it all, but... At the end, he says, listen, you've watched God work, so choose today who you're going to serve. The gods of, from Egypt and in the wilderness or this land, or are you going to choose to worship the God who led us here? And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And they said, we want to serve the Lord. He said, I don't know that you're going to be good at that. And they said, we still want to do it. He said, okay, we're going to serve the Lord. And what do we discover? Joshua knew his people, didn't he? Because they weren't real faithful at that. And so we end up with the kings and the prophets. And what is the choice that the kings and the prophets keep, are constantly being laid before them? Follow the Lord or go your own way. If you follow the Lord, I will give you life and prosperity and blessings and I will protect you and watch over you. And you will be my people and I will be your God. And if you don't, then you're on your own and you're going to suffer the consequences of this world. And then Jesus came, and Jesus walked in, and what's the first thing that Jesus said when he began his public ministry? Repent and believe, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, believe. You have a choice. Change the direction you're going and put your faith in here. You can continue the way you're going, but God says, come back into my kingdom. He preached the choice. Believe God or continue going the direction you're going, which will lead to your destruction. Peter's given a choice, isn't he? Peter, I'm going to warn you. You're going to be tempted to deny me. Peter says, "Ah, no, I won't. What happens? Oh, yes, he does, right? He had a choice, though, didn't he? When the woman said, I think I know you, you're one of those disciples. He could have said, yes, I am. But he didn't, did he? Three times he denied him. And then Jesus, interestingly enough, Jesus gives him three options, three choices, excuse me, he asks him three times to have a choice to come back to him at the end of John, doesn't he? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? You know I do. You see, we have the choice to love him and follow him. We have the choice, next slide please, to turn our back and walk away and deny him. Paul is constantly calling the churches to come back, to believe, to choose God over sin. John, in the letters of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he always is asking us to do what? Love God 
and love our neighbor. You can't say you love God and not love your neighbor. You've got to choose. You can choose to be unloving, but the right thing is to choose to be loving. And the book of Revelation, for all that we get wound off on weird things in there, you know what basically, you want me to sum up the book of Revelation? Choose to be faithful, and it'll all work out. That's the message of the book of Revelation in a nutshell. Don't worry about the strange stuff. Don't worry about the enemy. Don't worry about the struggles. Don't worry about that. You trust me and walk with me, and guess what? I'll deliver you through the storm when you choose to follow. Next slide, please. Joshua said, choose this day who you will serve. And Jesus said, you know what? You need to enter through the narrow gate. You need to choose to follow the narrow path that goes through the narrow gate. There's a wide path that will lead to destruction. There's a lot of other choices you can make out there that will take you to places you don't want to go. And many of us have traveled down some of those roads, haven't we? And then we came to our senses and we realized what? We want to find the narrow gate. We want to find the path of Jesus. We want to choose to walk with him. Next slide, please. So do we choose to follow Jesus? And, and I recognize something, because this is true in my life. In this midst, in this circle on Sunday morning, choosing to follow Jesus is relatively easy. Because we know we're surrounded by all these people that are there for us, right? When does that choice become difficult? Just outside that door, doesn't it? That choice becomes more difficult when we're out there. Because now we're confronted with other things and we have to make choices. How do I respond to this person? How do I think about this? How do I look at that? What do I say? What do I do? How do I treat this person? How do I think about myself? And that's where God says, listen, I don't leave you alone. I send my spirit with you. He's not just here in worship with us, helping us in our hearts. But when we ask Jesus into our lives, he goes with us out these doors every place we go through the presence of his Holy Spirit. And he's continually telling us, this is how you need to choose to live today. That is, as Jesus taught you to live. What did Jesus say? What did he have to teach us in Scripture that informs us on how we behave out there? That says The Scripture says that the Holy Spirit will remind us of all of God's words, and he'll be there for us so that we can choose every day to follow him. Next slide, please. The problem is that I think sometimes we don't realize that Jesus is calling us to make a choice. To choose this day who we will serve. I don't know if some of you follow the chosen, some of you don't. You can, they just, that's a personal decision for you to do, but I like the chosen. And one of my favorite scenes is at the end of season one, episode seven and eight, where he calls Matthew the tax collector, to come follow him. And he says, Matthew, come follow. And Matthew looks and he goes, me? You want me to come? And Jesus goes, yes, you. I want you to come. And all the disciples are standing around and going, you want him to come? I mean, <laughs> I mean talk about arrogance. Well, we know why you called us, but we don't know why you're calling him. And Matthew leaves his tax collecting booth. He leaves the power and the money and the prestige to follow. He chooses Jesus and following him over staying in his old life, which was comfortable, but very lonely. And interposed with that in the very next episode is the calling of Nicodemus. Jesus asked Nicodemus to join him. And you remember that last scene? Nicodemus comes to the market to meet Jesus, to go with him. I know it's not in Scripture that way. But I love that scene because Nicodemus is confronted with what? A choice. Do I follow Jesus and leave behind what the world thinks I am and wants me to be? Or do I not follow Jesus and I choose to stay in my old life? And Nicodemus chooses poorly, doesn't he? In that show anyway. And you see him crying because he realizes he's choosing the wrong thing. And I think sometimes we're amazed that God loves us enough to call us and he calls every one of us. He calls every person he's ever created. 
He's going to call a little gunner one day. He's going to call the oldest of us who have never turned to him. He's going to keep calling us to come to him because his desire is for us to always choose him. And all we have to do is turn our eyes and our hearts towards him and say, Jesus, I believe. We don't have to have all the knowledge of what that means. <laughs> I remember one time my son was two, three years old. He must have been two because Kelly wasn't born yet. And they were at McDonald's eating chicken nuggets. And this is in the story of parent, uh, children watch you. And he holds up this chicken nugget. And he goes, this, in his own childish voice, this is the body. <laughs> and he breaks the nugget in half. <laughs> and then he holds up his cup of orange or whatever it was. He goes, this is the blood. <laughs> and we said, and what do we call it when you do that? And he goes, Moonion. Do you know what that means? He goes, no. <laughs> and I thought to myself, you know, sometimes I don't know what it means because it's too marvelous. I don't know. I mean, for 30-some years now, I've been pastoring. For 50-some years, I've been trying to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And I still discover things. And I think if I talk to those of you who have followed him longer than I have, you would say, I still don't know everything there is to know. We don't have to have it all in our worked out to start, do we? All we have to do is say, I want to follow. I choose you today, in this moment. And he says, okay, come on, let's go. And he begins to work and do an amazing thing. Will you decide to follow Jesus here and out there? Will you choose to follow him every morning, to rise up and say, today I will walk with him? Not because I'm afraid of what will happen if I don't walk with him, but because I know that if I do walk with him, I'll have the most amazing life and I won't have to worry about any of the rest. He will see me through. Because he said he came to give us life abundantly. And our best life is when we choose to follow Jesus. Like some of you, I've tried it both ways and nothing works so well the other way. But when I put Jesus first, when I choose him every morning, my day is better. My life is better, and the world is better. Will you follow him? Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, help us this day to choose you. To choose to follow you in the big things and the little things. To follow you with our hearts and our desires and our obedience. Help us, Lord, when we make poor choices, when we wander away, when we find that we aren't following as we should, to come home. But help us always to put our faith and trust in you, and decide to follow you everywhere, everywhere you go. In Jesus' name, the one who leads us. Amen. Amen. A couple of quick announcements. Tuesday is bell practice at 6 p.m. and choir at 7. Wednesday morning we'll have our morning Bible study as we continue through the book of Isaiah. But we will not be having family night. It's Valentine's Day. So any of you that have forgotten to buy your Valentine something... This is the best I can do for you is this warning right now. <laughs> Judgment Day is coming. <laughs> Sunset, February 14th. Woe unto all those who choose poorly. <laughs> Men's Bible study this Saturday at 8.30. There's a light breakfast at 8. We meet downstairs uh, in the uh, kitchen and man cave back there. Next Sunday... We're having soup and sandwich luncheon. Woohoo! We do like to eat. And so, anyway, uh, after church, downstairs, all you can eat soup and sandwiches. Uh, come and be a part of that. Invite people to come. And the ladies' aid is going to meet Monday, this Monday, so they can make sure everything's ready. Okay. You know what? There's pink and orange slips that were supposed to be handed out today. Okay, thank you, Kitty. And Chuck. Okay, they can. So when you go out, Kitty and Chuck will have, and Tina or whoever else is out there, will have two sheets of paper. The ladies get the pink slip. Okay. 
It's purple. It's purple. Okay, not pink. It's purple. Men get orange. You, men get pumpkins and women get something pretty. Um, anyway, we're going to do something new and different for Mother's Day and Father's Day. Something that for a lot of years I've been wanting to do and I've never succeeded at it yet. But Lynn and Bob were positive about it, so I said, okay, we're going we're to do it this year. We're asking you, to uh, the women, to write something down that you learned from your mother. Um, it could be about life, it could be about spirit stuff. You're going to get a slip of paper, you can do it in an email, or you can write it on that piece of paper and turn it back in. It could be a sentence. My mother taught me to be kind. It could be a list of things. My mom taught me to bake. She may taught me to do this, to do this, to do that. I don't know. It could be a paragraph. We're not looking for a dissertation or a book. We're looking for something small. And then for the men, we're asking you to write something about what you learned from your father, about life or, or about spiritual life or, or your everyday life. It could be the same thing, something short and small. It could be a list. It could be a, a phrase. It could be a story. We're going to collect those, lightly edit them, and put them in a booklet so that on Mother's Day, you'll get a keepsake booklet that is, contains the wisdom that has been passed down through the generations about what it means to be a godly woman and how to live your lives, okay? And then on Father's Day, all the men are going to get a copy of this wisdom that's been passed down. It's a way that we can follow what it said in the passage that was read this morning about tell your children what you've learned. And so I'm excited about this. So you have until April 1st for the women and May 1st for the men to get these back in. So you don't have to stand in the narthex and write it today, although if you choose to do that, it'll be out of the way and you won't forget. You will have more opportunities to do this, uh, but anyway, that is out there. Those sheets are there for you. And I think this is going to be an exciting thing um, to look at and to pass on. Uh, we will also be asking you, if you put something in there, if you can get a picture of you and your mom or you and your dad, we would love to do that so that we can put that in the book so that people can say, oh, this is who that is, and know who that is, and I'm excited about that. Any other, um, Dan, you have stuff downstairs? Dan has stuff downstairs. Okay, <laughs> we have some, some, some baked goods and so forth downstairs, and the donations from that go to Neon. After the service, you can all go by and, and wave at Gunner, and... Make sure that you uh, help him know that he is loved, as of course he is. If God has been speaking to you this morning, and perhaps you want to choose for the first time or for another time to follow him and make a choice for him, or there's a burden upon your heart and you would like to have somebody pray for you or for somebody that you know, the deacons will be up front here to pray for you at the end of the service. Go be light in the darkness. Go be kind and be back next Sunday. Till then, may you know the love of God, the salvation of Jesus Christ. May the Holy Spirit hold you in his hand now and forever. Go in peace. Amen.